So this month, uh, and we're bringing this back. It's been a long time since we've done this, uh, and it's a great time because we got a lot of cool shirts right now, is for either one of our big bundles, the RGB or the Super Bundle. With that purchase, you actually get your choice of any two shirts you want for under a dollar. So Boom. under a dollar for a dollar for both. Yeah, and the reason why that's even that is because actually the system doesn't even allow Doug to put it for zero. <laughs> for so zero. he had to mark it off for ninety nine percent, which I think it makes it like twenty six cents. I that's think for like each that. one. Yeah. So <laughs> for under almost under fifty cents, you're getting uh, two shirts of your choice, um, and for as long as they last. So that's uh, you guys got to get on there. Make sure you guys. Uh, grab that right away, and then you get, I believe, an email, right, Doug, will get sent over to them, which will give them the the, the code. The link or whatever to get yeah, those Yeah, the link shirts. and the code to go over to uh, Big Cartel and then pick whatever shirts that they want. So so the RGB bundle is MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, MAPS Aesthetic put together. It's nine months of exercise programming, and it's discounted. Discounted pretty big. It's like over 20-something percent off. The Super Bundle includes those plus... Maps anywhere and Maps Prime, and then it takes like thirty something percent off. So enroll enroll in either one of those and get two shirts for almost free. You can find those at mindpumpmedia.com. If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go: Mind Pump. Mind Pump with your hosts Sal De Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. Man, I'm uh, hey, hey, I'm a little hyped, ah, hyped and excited for uh, the kettlebell competition this weekend, man. This is oh, gonna be. Oh my gosh, it's coming. Be, we got what a hundred, almost a hundred competitors. Yeah. It went. It it's went. Be a madhouse. It in here. became like one of the biggest ones. How? Uh, what do you guys think about those uh, trophies? Those are sick. Yeah, they're cool. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I thought yeah. that yeah, was. They're gonna like those a lot. How'd yeah. you get them yeah. to make a cast of your penis? Yeah, that was uh, kind of expensive. Because it's ma- functional, too. A lot of material that we had to use. So. <laughs> For the ladies. No, we did uh, something pretty pretty cool. I'm excited. It's not that. Like That's a something. serious gentleman. battle axe, man. So it uh, yeah. looks pretty dope. And I liked it because it was different. You know, in, in men's physique, we used to get these swords, right? If you want, Which I never won. I was really pissed. Why don't you want a sword? <laughs> you got to win. You got to like win. Conan sword? Who doesn't want a sword? No, I right. wanted a sword. I oh, you were pissed because yeah, you didn't get yeah, one? Yeah, because I didn't get one. I wanted one. Oh. I absolutely, I fucking wanted one. If you win a sword, you won the whole show overall, which, you know, even if you get first, first place, you still got to beat the overall, right? So mm-hmm. that's like when, you know, Arnold and... You know, Columbo always went against each other, right? Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. So they always he and he Arnold always took him for the for the overall and but Franco always won like his class and the so, short class or yeah. whatever. Yeah, it's like you get a ninja star, I get a fucking sword. <laughs> yeah, it is <laughs> tough <laughs> shit. It's a it's a total like there's no that's what I'm saying. It's like a badass sword. You get like nothing, dude. Yeah. Yeah. You don't get nothing for second, oh, dude. Oh man, yeah, not you even a get a fucking handshake. Yeah. Yeah. A little yeah. little BB or BB. And you guys, second place yeah. is a set of steak knives. You guys yeah. see our boy Arya too. He just took second place on his last. He's gonna nail this is a, so, again. Three shows within 28 days. He did? Yeah. Dude, he's, he's a madman. You know what's, you know what's crazy? How impressive. do you keep that up? I That's, got a question. I was so. just going to ask you, Adam. Do you think it's easier for him to be able to do that because he's natural? You know, like to kind of stay in shape and stay lean? Do you think maybe he has less weight fluctuations? Uh, or do you think maybe the benefit of just knowing his body better? Well, yeah, I would say I would give him more credit like that for like, the for that. Yeah, because there's probably a lot of guys that run a lot of anabolics that think they know their bodies really, really well. But until you've put yourself in the type of because because what because here's what I'm thinking. Like I know guys, a lot of guys who take a lot of gear and they'll take a lot of like fat burning type cycles and gear and stuff pre contest, but then they have to go off to let their body. Reacclimate, and I guess if you're natural, you don't have to do that. Well, if you're someone like Arya who has to do all the natural things, there, there's probably less of a rebound, right? So if you're somebody who's taking Winstrol and and Clin, and you're 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 letting a, the, a lot of the drugs to help help you along the way, and you rely on that, so again, and we talk about this on the show a lot, right? Like, you know, not to take anything away from anyone who runs it. I mean, shit, I ran I ran Clin for the last two weeks of shows and. Uh, testosterone through my shows, so you know I'm not knocking anybody at all for that. But when you, if you've relied on that to get you in shape, and you've never been in like you know super great shape without it, then there tends to be more of a rebound when you come off of it, right? So you come off, 
your testosterone levels are now dropping down. You're weaker. Mm -hmm. So that's a little depressing. You come off the clin, which is like making your metabolism and winstrol through the roof. And I'm also thinking in terms of like water retention, you're more likely, you know, to hold water when you're on androgens. Uh, maybe the thyroid, if they're doing thyroid, you know, uh, hormones, well, pre-contest, you don't want to necessarily stay on those all the time. Yeah. Well, that's like your cleanse and stuff, which can affect that. But your most guys, uh, that, uh, that are doing, that are using drugs or anabolics letting in the show know, uh, what types of testosterones they should be peeling back getting, cause you don't want to be holding a bunch of water when you hit stage. So as you as you get closer to stage, you're tapering down your your testosterone already. So you're mm -hmm. you're pulling out synthetics like that, um, or switching them over to like sipinate and things like that uh, versus longer things like est uh, esters. Like yeah, it's uh, just interesting to me because just observation is anecdote, but observationally speaking, I've known a couple natural competitors who looked phenomenal, and they were able to compete uh, frequently. Like they it didn't seem to you know they didn't have these crazy rebounds. Um, so I'm wondering if it's just knowing your body better and the fact that you're just not having to worry so much. Well, about I think it's a good call to manipulate. You know? I think it's a good call that, on that. That I think it's both. You know, I think it's you, you're required to compete at the level that he's at. Right? I mean, he's a, he gets on Olympia stage. I mean, just blow it blows me away when we talk about this because I I honestly do not, and I know quite a few that claim it, but I don't know anybody else that truly is. 100% natural and gets gets all the way to the Olympia stage for men's physique. That's incredibly impressive. So the level of understanding his body and you could right, you guys could tell when he pulled up his, you know, I've yet to meet, I had yet to meet somebody who took their tracking to another level oh, than yeah. I have like his, I mean, he's spreadsheeting and like, he's yeah, crazy. Insane amount of detail. Yeah. I mean, I, into that, yeah, yeah, I tracked the shit out of my, all, all my stuff, but he was on a, I mean, a mm -hmm. whole nother level. So you know, a guy to do that, uh, he just knows his body so, so well. And he's not re obviously not relying on drugs to get him there. So, you know, there's probably a, a less of that. Plus, what you're saying, there's stuff that's going on uh, chemically, you know, the inside of your body that you're changing and hormonally, which can, you know, have to do with that. But I, honestly, I think more psychological and really understanding the body for these guys that, that blow up afterwards because there's this... Mm. You know, and that's part of the. That was part of the reason why I, I when we started this, I was. I, I know we don't talk so much about competing anymore, but I talked a lot about it when we first started because I was just blown away by, you know, how many poor relationships with food and exercise existed within this. You know, the professional level of competing. You know, it's this balls to the wall, take whatever it takes to get there. And then when you accomplish that, it's like fucking wow, whatever. Binge. Oh, you, oh, the guy, they'll bring like food with them, mm -hmm. like boxes of like, you know, Twix and whatever candies that, that they've been craving and they'll take it with them to eat right after, yeah. literally right after the show's over. You know what I mean? Oh, it's super popular now, like for guys, girls, or, you know, if depending if you have a girl, like to, the partner buys them this just huge, you know, grocery list of cookies and brownies and candy and just tons Deep of dish pizza. Yeah, yeah, tons tons of that. Um and you will see they, a lot of them will shoot it in their shoot Instagram stories and show like all the food, the spread that they're about to crush. And most of those dudes, the crazy part is most of them crush that in that night, you know. It's yeah. not like Here's all the food I'm gonna be eating for the next month because I missed it. It's like, well, who well, was well, it? You're dying. Yeah. I mean, let's be honest. Like, who was it that we were talking about? Who talking to that said he gained something like 25, 30 pounds within? Was it Johnny? I think it was Johnny. I, think it was Johnny. I, 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 one of my shows, that, and that was a major eye opener for me. I had a, I had a binge after a show, and it, it, you know, and I guess that's the the part of me that I get it. You know, I understand like it's really tough to stop. Like when you get so shredded so lean you've restricted so hard for so long it's really easy to justify like i deserve this you know what i'm saying like and i can i can afford to go crazy and still look awesome you know well, would and, you be able to bounce back and then do another show in a couple days or a week i have so yeah. i yeah i never ran i didn't run i've never ran three and 28 but i ran a back-to-back -back show where there was only a couple weeks in between mm -hmm. um there's pros and cons to that um, I liked it because I was already in really good shape and then I'd have like a night off or two of eating and just kind of enjoy myself, you know, go hit the, the sushi and enjoy some desserts and kind of, you know, you know, pile on a few calories. And then I get right back into contest prep mode 
and so, and I'm already in good condition. I'm already in the mental focus, so I like that part of it. But it can get wearing and taxing on the body. You know, it just you're you're living in a caloric deficit for that long all the time. Like you're and just just being super lean. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah just so, being super lean all the time. Yeah, so it's to see him do that, do that naturally, and three shows back to back. I mean. It's, it's pretty impressive. I know he's incorporating more uh, frequency um, into his workouts, uh, you know, because of, uh, you know, the influence that MAPS aesthetic has had on him. And he's looking pretty incredible, man. Yeah, no, he's... I mean, he's, he carries a... Uh, I mean, his muscles look very, very full uh, going into his contest, which, you know, especially for a natural athlete, that's tough. In my opinion, when they when they first created the, the category, I really believe... This is why I wish that, you know, he would win the show, win is I really believe that, and this is where the politics get in, it's really unfortunate, is I believe they intended his look to be what represents the league. Like his, that I mean, the idea of men's physique was that men's bodybuilding got so out of control with anabolics that the average person looked at that and said like, I don't want to take a bunch of stuff to look like that, you know? And if you do, that's all to each their own, but the a majority of people looked at that and said, that's not obtainable to me. I don't want to take tons of stuff like that. And okay, so in comes men's physique. And men's physique was this, you know, cover of men's health look. Like it's supposed to look obtainable for a natural man. Like a natural guy should be able to, if he's got good genetics and he trains hard, he diets correctly, could obtain this look. And so I really think he is a, a great example of what that looks like, you know, somebody who has put the years in and the discipline into sculpting and shaping a, an incredible, balanced, symmetrical physique that is uh, obtainable naturally. But unfortunately, you know, like anything, just like bodybuilding, you know, it's you you see the look just progress and it becomes, you know, the freakier and more impressive you look becomes what wins it's, it, there's no sport more evident than that than female bodybuilding how that went yeah I don't, you know when female bodybuilding first started you ever just look at pictures of like the female like rachel i think rachel mcclish they like look the like first, women's bikini now like, uh, what, 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 what women's bikini looks women's like women's bikini looks more muscular than the way female that's what i mean like the old bodybuilder yeah. women look they were just very fit you know looking they were natural and then it started to progress and then Corey everson kind of brought it to the next level and then next thing you know like these chicks are I mean, they're on some serious Yoked. gear, and they look cr like they look crazier than I ever could even dream of looking like with my you know male body. It just got insane, and it became a very cultish you know kind of sport. Kind of destroyed it. So I think that's what they were afraid of. But they got to be they got to get better with that kind of stuff. You know? Yeah, you know, and it sucks because the IFBB and NPC are the most well known, and there's natural there's natural. Yeah, there's, no, there's really not really any. Yeah, there's exposure there. There isn't any. And sometimes I think like, okay, well, maybe if if because the way IFBB and NPC is growing, it's insane. I mean, I was just blown away when we went to Aria's show. And, you know, that was I mean, it'd be like you guys. Oh, like, it was a packed house. Yeah. Like every seat. That was prejudging. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was yeah, prejudging. It's crazy. It's crazy to see where it's grown. So I, I think, okay, well, maybe when it grows so out of control and so big, maybe a lot of people that decide will start to bleed over into natural. Maybe you'll see this new. And we have buddies like our boy Jason Sinatra, who is a stud, an all-natural bodybuilder. He got on the uh, all-natural Olympia stage and competed and uh, looks badass mm -hmm. and a, a great all-natural dude. Um, but you just don't hear about that league. Like Nobody really talks about it. And I know, what is it? Uh, is it PNBA, PNBA and... What's another one? There's two. Like there's two. There's two. I have no idea. Yeah, and they're just not. They're just not well known. They're not the one, like the guys that are all on the cover of the magazines are coming out of you know IFBB and so or WBFF. That's the other one mm -hmm. that's really well known. But neither one of those are tested, so mm -hmm. you can do whatever you want. So it's crazy to see the direction of it. I was very fascinated in the in the just the business side of it. There's so many businesses that are popping up around it because it's it's a growing industry. You know, I wonder how big bodybuilding is and if you compare it to like a more recent developed sport like crossfit which one is generating more revenue money? yeah oh for sure for sure crossfit you think I mean, so oh yeah, yeah no not even close i mean once once crossfit hit uh i mean once reebok signed with them it just took that to, I mean, it just goes to show you how cultish you know uh, bodybuilding is it's like this cult you know, well, it's, it's still that way. Yeah. What's interesting is CrossFit also, I mean, they, they definitely absorbed all like different types of uh, uh, like supplements and, 
you know, like they're looking for all these extra like accessories and all these different things to go along with it. And you just see, you see how companies just boom, they just come in like flies and, and absorb that, that cult like, you know, culture. And uh, yeah, it's interesting. It's very, it's very similar. Well, well they're both hate, very similar. Hate, hate it or love it, you got to respect what Greg Glassman did. I mean, I mean, of course. I mean, from a marketing perspective, I mean, the guy was fucking brilliant, dude. I'm sorry, people like, fucking love it. Yeah, it's. Yeah. I mean, taking. Well, it's fun to watch. That's for sure. It's a spectator friendly, you know, resistance training based. Sport. I can't think like well, weightlifting. Yeah, not nearly as fun to watch. Powerlifting, boring I was as hell. I going to say like even yeah, Olympic lifting, like these kinds of things that are very specialized and and, and specific. You know, you don't get a lot of viewership uh, in the Olympics. No, unless you're a weightlifter. Like if I showed weightlifting to my you yeah. know my aunt, she's gonna be like, well, okay, who cares. If well, I look show at her wrestling, cross- dude. Look at yeah. what they, they took wrestling away from the Olympics because so, it wasn't it made so, me so exciting so enough for people. So it's here's, like you got to do WWF for that shit. You give know, them, like, give them knives or something. Here you yeah. go. Do you think yeah. that Backyard it goes? Wrestling. Do you think that it eventually gets into the Olympics? What CrossFit? CrossFit? Oh no, I believe it does. You, you think, think CrossFit so? does? I believe no. it does. I believe it does. I believe it. No, they would need to have it like more structured because they they change it all the time. You know, like it, they, you have to be able to train for something you, specific. Here, you know, it you, used why? to be. Why? Well, here's the thing. Why? Why would you not do it exactly the way well, they gear? No, the no, car? no. But why would see, they? I, I think I know what Justin's saying is you need some kind of a, a standard for yeah. Olympic Olympics. If they're they going to go that. train at like an Olympic facility, like they train very specialized, you know, every day for like they know their run inside and out. Yeah. They know the weather. There has to be a particular the, like the altitude. Mm-hmm. You what know you, what I'm saying? What do you they mean? have to? They, what, what, why? 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 Why do you think that would keep it at the Olympics? Because the Olympics, uh, that's the way that they review sports. So yeah. if I say here's CrossFit, and they look at all these events, they're going to be like, well, they don't – How do, they're all different. Like this one has these three different lifts and this run. Mm-hmm. This one over here has a kettlebell movement and this and there and that. What they would want is standards. Yeah, because well, even the comboed standards. ones, like let's That's, be honest, the comboed is- ones like where you, where you do the um, – the, uh, 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 what do you call that? Skiing, the skiing, and then you shoot, and then it's like yeah. a combo of like – Four or five different things, but it's, but there's it's a standard. standardized. Yeah, that's well, all. So this is this is the debate I have with that. Is so, so what? Just because they've done it like that forever, you don't think that they can? They can? Yeah, bro, I'm it. just saying it's going to be an uphill battle for them oh to my change God. the opinion look, of the. So here's the thing: the council. Two things. Number one, nobody cares about getting the Olympics anymore. It used to be, yeah, you start a sport and that's like the goal, like get in the Olympics, and that's like. Like Joe, like Ben Weeder, Joe Weeder's brother. Yeah, that was like dream. A dream was to put bodybuilding in uh, in the Olympics. Today, like CrossFit, it's too subjective. Though. Would CrossFit make more money in the Olympics? Well, uh, first of all, to get in the Olympics, they'd have to prove that CrossFit is being competed uh, worldwide, which it's then on they, its way. Then they would have to prove that there's a standard that of competition, uh, and they would have to show the standard. They'd have to show a, a long lineage. Would it even be worth the the time and the trouble? I don't know. I don't even think they care. Yeah, you know that's just the way it is nowadays. Yeah, like people care. don't really care anymore about getting certain events in the in the. Some events are important to get in the Olympics, like collegiate, like wrestling. Like without the Olympics, now would it, like would what do you where do you where do where does wrestling go? Mm-hmm. Like without wrestling, without it's the not Olympics, a professional league or anything. no? There's high school and college in the U.S., which we have a huge pedigree. But then, and then there's yeah. world competitions and stuff. But well, then they can convert them into MMA. Yeah, you know? like it would be like putting great it would be like candidates. putting you know BMXing in in the Olympics, which they could do. Like in the Winter Olympics, now you have like snowboarding type events and stuff like that, which they're starting to do. Uh, but they're all you know yeah. judged. I, and, yeah, like you said, like it, I mean, if they evaluated it based on if they had like three different workouts or something you know what i mean if they like broke it down like you're doing fran or whatever tested well i think that's that's how we think but that's what what makes crossfit unique and and the the competitive side of it is that that's just it is part of the mystery of you don't know and if you're going to be the best in the world you got to be ready for whatever's thrown at you and that's the idea so I, I kind of disagree with you guys. I think I, no, that I think you're, I get where you're going, but I, I think you're thinking too much like a businessman consumer. Whereas mm-hmm. the Olympic, the Olympics, could, they don't fucking think like that. Like yeah. they don't think the way you're thinking. They don't think, oh my god, people would love to watch this. The mystery behind it. They are terrible. Yeah, you don't think you don't think that, you don't think the Olympics are a business. I I do think they're a business, but I think they're when it comes to evaluating and putting sports up, I think there's a lot more politics and shit involved. Yeah. Like. 
well, well, I'm, you not, talk, I'm not well, disagreeing with politics, but I think to to discount that there's not major thought that goes into the business side of mm, the Olympics is is silly. You would have to. Uh, you would no. I mean, it's more politics than business. I'll tell you what. When well, I mean, they, they're do you know how hand. many countries? Like, how many countries will host an Olympics? Will build a stadium for it? Will spend money on mm-hmm. it? And then the Olympics is gone, and it's a fucking ghost town. Like in China, there's what they did for the Chinese Olympics. There's these stadiums that they built. They're just they're just there now. Uh, do you make money off the Olympics coming to your country? A lot of countries lose money. The reason why they want it is to display their national, you know, pride and stuff like that. It's di- it's a lot different nowadays, and it's very difficult. And the the, the big question is, Doug, would I like cross you, I like you to even want to Google be in the fact Olympics? check this? I would I would love to see what the uh, uh, average you know, city makes from uh, Olympics coming into their their city. I, I think Sal's way off on this one. I think that the I think it actually the reason why they build stadiums and do that is because it m- brings millions of dollars to the city. Uh, I, I think I, that I, it's very much so a business. Business. I think they lose actually. Yeah, yeah. Google it up. Let's oh, see. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, we've read. We I've read lots of studies on on how cities have lost money, but they don't. A lot of them don't care. It's like they want that national pride. Like China really wanted to demonstrate themselves mm. to the world that they can organize this incredible event, and they did. Well, you know, you make job. a lot of money is when you host the Super Bowl to an existing stadium you already have, right? Mm-hmm. Like, oh my God, does that bring a lot of business to you, your way? You definitely can, absolutely. Yeah, I know for sure. The and Super also, Bowl, you have to. I'm add, curious about the Olympics. Yeah, I, I, would I think, think it's different though, like because you have to have build these humongous structures, so that yeah. that def- definitely costs. Yeah, and you have to ask yourself, like, would CrossFit even be interested in, you know, doing the Olympics? Would it be wise for them to do it? I don't know. I mean, does that I, say that it made 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 them twenty five billion dollars right there? No, that's I think it cost them twenty five billion. Yeah, it, it's uh, you know, I'll tell you what, Brazil. In fact, there were protests in Brazil over the Olympics because people there were saying, "Why are you spending money?" On the Olympics, when, when we need those poverty, that's y- right there. Yeah, yeah, we need all the shit. Um, so it's like this big debate uh, going on. What does it say there, Doug? It says strikingly little evidence that such events increase tourism or draw new investment. Spending lavishly on short-lived event is economically speaking a dubious long-term strategy. Yeah, even you know what's funny? It's e- dubious. Even stadiums, mm-hmm. even when state when cities build stadiums, what they'll do is they'll and this is the debate too with a stadium, right? Let's say you're a, you're a city and you want to have you want to build a stadium so you can have a sports team. Where do they get the money for the stadium? A lot of them comes from your tax dollars. So they're taxing people to build the stadium mm-hmm. that costs X amount of billions of dollars. Then they're going to put a team in there, and then the only people that can really afford to go to games are like wealthy people. And it's like this debate: like you're taxing. Everybody to pay for something that everybody's going to benefit from, and businesses aren't necessarily making money. It's it's actually quite uh, quite the debate. But with the Olympics, uh, when the Olympics is concerned, it's a lot of politics, not yeah. so not as much business as you would as you would even think. It's just kind of crazy. Well, it'd be interesting to see. I I still you know financially or not, I still think it's a, they're heading in that direction. I think if you were to talk to like Glassman or um, you might even be able to Google that, like with thoughts on CrossFit moving in that direction to try and get in there. Well, like, I know bodybuilding is never going to get in the Olympics. Yeah, no. Yeah. Cause then, then, now that makes sense because there's this, yeah. there's no, well, bodybuilding is well, actually, at least CrossFit has some metrics to work with, right? Right. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of judged events in, uh, in, I mean, there's, you know, there's synchronized swimming. There's, uh, you know, there's all kinds of different events. Uh, that's a good, that's a good point. There's yeah. a lot, but okay. the, Pro- and bodybuilding is done all over the world. It's on. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, no, right. it's a worldwide sport. The problem is the drugs. Like when Mr. Olympia won't be able to compete in the Olympics, now what? You know what I'm saying? Because mo- most of the money that goes to bodybuilding comes from the U.S. And none of those athletes would pass any freaking drug test. Oh, my God. <laughs> you know? <laughs> That's so true. Yeah. Oh, yeah. see, it says there, sports sp- uh, standardization for CrossFit. Yeah, that would be a big one. Justin, I wanted to ask you about mm. uh, Wim Hof. Yeah, Dude, you oh, never I talked had a great about that. experience with that. Yeah, that's right. Because we uh, hosted the Wim Hof. You didn't even look cold, bro. Uh, dude, uh, you know I went into that arrogantly. I'm just gonna put it out there. Like I, I we, we went through a bunch of like of the uh, actual breathing techniques and um, the the sequence that um, you know Wim Hof sort of uh, he has a protocol specifically to how to kind of get. Um, to this like ecstasis state, right? To, to kind of get outside of yourself and to, to really calm, calm down and, and tap into that autonomic system. So, um, that, 
was like perfect timing for me because <laughs> like I had like the most stressful week ever. And it wasn't even like anything insanely chaotic was happening. Like specifically, it was just the accumulation of like m- many things. And then, um, you know, before that, I actually like I had the worst abdominal pain of my life, went to the hospital and everything to check out and get scanned, make sure nothing was, you know, super wrong with me. Um, just turned out you needed a good poop. Just turned out, man. You know, had some blockage. <laughs> how, how much of the actual course were you able to sit in on? Did you sit in? Sit I in? did the first day, so I prefaced that because I didn't. I didn't. Uh, I had a lot going on. I didn't get to do the second day, but um, yeah, I sat in through the whole thing. So okay, so yeah, I went through the whole protocol, and so you do like these these thirty breaths. So it's mainly focused on hyper oxygenating the body. So. Um, we don't take really big, deep breaths and we don't really understand how to fill up your lungs completely. And so they, Does she talk about why, why that is, why we're all short breath or we're chest breathers. Uh, I think, um, I think it's your posture and it's just, it's just your body's just kind of acclimating to like, uh, you know, just being in a seated position or, um, just, just like doing daily tasks. Like you're, you're not really like, fo- you have to be really intentional to, to fill your lungs to that capacity. So, you know, they do studies on that and they show that when people are in, uh, like moderately stressful situations, like we have every day, right. Mm-hmm. That you breathe more shallow yeah. and that when people are placed in really relaxing, uh, situations, then they naturally will start to do the full diaphragmatic breathing and uh, I mean, I think it has to do with the fact that the shallow breathing, uh, that's your fight or flight yeah. you know, breath. And in, in the short term, it's better to breathe that way. Like if a lion walks in the room, you're better off breathing shallow so you get the fuck out because that's mm-hmm. your quick, you know, your quick reaction. But if you do that all day, it's actually detrimental. Yeah. And what's interesting, like if you notice when you do cardio or, or when you're actually running, your heartbeat is, is really pounding, like how you get to that state where, you know, you get a little bit of euphoria from it and you feel these good effects. Cause like, I, I guarantee some of that has to do with like hyper oxygenating the body and getting, you know, more air in. Um, and so anyway, we did these we did these drills where we're, we're really expanding the rib cage and, and kind of like stimulating here in the sternum mm-hmm. and uh, just just getting in tune with, um, you know, how to how to be more expansive with that breath and also like breathe through the belly and then fill that up and then into the chest. And um, I mean, really, it's boring to talk about, but it was really impactful to go through. So it's it's one of those things so that you just, you just have to go through it and you have to do it. And, and applying it is really difficult Uh, because you have to literally just be intentional with it. You do 30 breaths, like you you do this full, huge breath, like inhale, and then you get rid of it. You you exhale and uh, quickly, and then you go right back into a big, deep breath, and you do that for 30, and then you hold on the exhale on the last bit, which was something that I, I found difficulty in because... What you're doing now is you're trying to you're trying to calm down that panic in your body, right? So when you don't have air and you don't like your first reaction is to want to oh, I gotta breathe again, I gotta fill back up. And so um just that quieting that noise, because you have to realize your your body has plenty of oxygen at this point. You know, you, you've been going through all these breaths and getting all this oxygen in. You can hold your breath for a really long time mm. once you get past that initial point of panic. And uh, so for me, that was really what I carried over into then um, into the ice bath part of it. So you Is do, that what you the, do that three cycles. So, so the last part, I'll just like get this out. So 30, 30 breaths and then you hold and then uh, for as long as you can. And then right away after you have to breathe in again, you um, you you hold you 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 then go for ten second hold and then you go right back in and you do the cycle again. So you do that three times. Oh wow! Yeah, and it works. Yeah. So did, how do you did, how does it work then when you get in the like how does it work? In other words, I don't need to know the science, but what I mean is, what does it feel like getting into the ice bath after doing that versus not doing it? Well, like I said, it, you kind of you kind of learn to to calm like this this reactive part of your of your body where you're like you tense up and you and you and you you get into that panic fight flight mm. you know mode whereas we, if you can suppress that a bit and it 
and get get outside of yourself a little bit more like you can you can really like it ease into your environment and and make it work for you so um me going into the ice like the first time like i, I was like oh yeah i'll go first you know like arrogant asshole you know? like, <laughs> yeah no problem i've been in an ice before dude, no problem and uh but i've i've only been to like maybe my just right up to the chest and so i i you go in and then it went all the way up to the neck and so just just having that ice and everything go all the way up and over the chest it your body is just like oh my god i'm gonna die oh, you shit. know like i had this like this moment where my eyes got really big and and then i just looked up and i was, like i i seriously was in panic and then i just remembered you know because you lose it right then because that's the first shock of it i was like i lost oh shit and i i opened my mouth real wide i'm like <gasps> you know trying to get uh, breath in and i couldn't breathe because it's restrictive so it's like a panic it's a panic response. and then and then boom and then that sort of kicked in where it's like no you know chill relax and then i'm able to start kind of getting into that that breathing pattern and zone and um and you have to keep your hands on top of your legs so like the, the the closer your limbs are um you know the less surface or you know area you have to to um get exposed to the cold mm -hmm. so um so anyway i basically went through that whole process and then it, it's really interesting because what what you're seeking is how quickly you can get into that state so it's a lot like all of a sudden i got myself into a flow state oh wow yeah and it happened really fast because it was so shocking and and um and gnarly that once um it was probably like a couple seconds maybe it was like 15 seconds but you're in there for like two minutes and so like the initial shock the first time i did i was like oh god i'm gonna die and then i finally calmed down and then oh this isn't bad and then it was totally chill do you know when you read uh, Rise of Superman, they talk about this is really simple. Like the process that you're, you're going through is really similar to getting into the flow state, right? Mm -hmm. That's exactly what happens. And that's also why, you know, extreme sports uh, have so much success with it because it's this life or death. You feel like you're flipping upside down. Oh my God, I got to die. Like that's your, like the average person, just if you were to try to do a double backflip off of fucking huge ramp, yeah. we all would go, oh so this shit. This is a lot safer way to do that. Yeah, right. Yeah. So Which is great about it. Then that's what I appreciated. So I, so then after that, you, you get out and, and it's great because you get into this kind of horse stance. So you, it, it's kind of like a power stance. So, so you sit into it a bit. So you engage your muscles in your legs. And then what you do is you, you basically punch across and um, you're, you're doing like a core rotation and you're mm -hmm. really um, you're inhaling as you, as you go one way and then you're exhaling Some the tai, other. Tai Chi shit. It's like Tai Chi, but it, it felt a little bit more like, you know, those Fijian warrior guys that are just like, Ooh, ha, ah, Ooh, yeah, ah. yeah, and, yeah. and you do all that stuff. And they're playing cool music with Wim Hof. Actually, he, he, um, he writes his own music. He plays guitar and, and he like, he does this like cool tribal kind of oh, cool. uh, singing. And so there's a track like that going on. It was really cool, dude. It was like, for me, I'm not, I'm not into the whole, like, um, you know, like, uh, I hate to say this, but the, the more like the woo, like, like Yogi kind of yeah, like, turns you yeah, off. you know, let's all get into it. You know, <laughs> like I'm like, oh, okay, I can get into Why this. the voice? Like, oh, well, you know, let's and this, do this. talking like, about flow. Okay. So there's a reason like, why that is. Like, it was like warrior. You require right now. Okay. So this is like levels of getting better at getting into the flow state, like your macro and micro levels. And so when you do something so extreme that you're a physical person, right? So, putting you in a, a situation that felt life or death oh. helps force you Thank in. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, because in. for me, my initial reaction is to tense. And so what I do to overcome stress is to over tense. So like for me, like like lifting weights, for example, like I want to oh, squeeze as hard as I can to get through it. And my my go-to uh, operating system is is full throttle, you know, and and for me to to, to just barrel my way through. And it. This is the opposite, and I could not do that, dude, yeah. with this at all. It really fucked me up. And and you notice that when you watch um, some of the other guys that were a little more like had meditative practices, you mm -hmm. could tell who who actually has meditative practices uh. in their program. Because when they got in, you just watch and their demeanor changed, and then they got into that state really quickly. And they're able to just chill in there. 
And I was like, oh my God, dude. I was like, ah, ah. It kind of makes you realize like how much of our the difficulties we have in everyday life Fucking really have mind. to do with just us. Yeah, in it our is. mind, dude. You know, like, like literally your body is is telling you to panic, mm-hmm. but you're not in any dangers. You know, lay, sitting in, ba- in, in, in ice water for two minutes, if you're a healthy individual, it's not dangerous. You're fine. You're not going to die. But your body m- makes you feel like you are, at least your mind is. Mm-hmm. And we forget that we are the driver's of that yeah so did uh, you know did you get a chance i love numbers and stats did you get a chance to um hear her talk about like as humans like how much it's been recorded that we can actually control our internal temperature no they didn't address that i mean, i would be i'd be interested to see what some of the the as far as yeah i well, know i've heard uh, numbers, uh, numbers like yeah like yeah there. like you could like like some months might have be been in known their notes to, yeah to be able to lower or raise their temperature by like 20 degrees or something crazy like that's crazy when you think 20 about well there's yeah, a I vice there's crazy. a whole vice document um that's what i want to wim hof so i'm gonna have to go back and kind of go through that yeah we need to look that up because 20 fascinating 20 yeah no you'd be like damn i'm throwing some arbitrary number out there i don't know if it's because even if you could raise it and lower by four degrees that's like incredible 20 my god you'd be i think i don't think your heart would yeah i know that's why i I want to know if they talked about that whole process right after that so that that was all to to start like raising your core temperature again and so like you know pulling all that like i was you're drying yourself by by uh, intensifying your core and, and then your major muscle groups. And so, yeah, so it was interesting. And it's interesting to see where you have poor circulation too with like your your hands, your fingers, your 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 feet. Uh, and for me, the second time through, I really noticed my feet, you know, not having as good enough of circulation. Mm-hmm. And so that's something that I would apply. You could even use like uh, just put your feet in an ice bath or like your hands specifically to – to work on improving that. Interesting. So, yeah. See what, what, you know, it's interesting because we get in our own way a lot by saying things like, oh, I'm not into the, you know, that woo woo stuff. I'm not into that. And we've all said it. And it's like, we get in our own way. You know what I mean? Because oh, it totally. prevents us from yeah. trying things that very well may have some incredible application. Like you said, so yourself, like you could tell the, the guys and girls who meditated because they get in there yeah. in that ice bath and they were able to chill or, you know, no pun intended, yeah. uh, a little faster. Yeah, I think uh, exactly. And I think that's an ego thing. You know, for me, it's just this, I, it, it's all in how it's presented, right? So if if it's about improvement and performance like this was a more about human performance yeah, and, so and, you were like and I'm controlling yeah controlling your if it was about balancing your pink chakra then you'd be like i'm like uh, i'll sit this one out <laughs> you know what i mean like, i'm not gonna wear those pants and shit i'm not doing it damn well you're you're a physical feedback guy and this is why exactly. like i said why there's a lot of success and why we've seen this rapid growth in extreme sports is you don't have a choice. Like yeah. you, you, you get you get dropped into an ice bath, and it's like you start fucking yeah. panting like crazy, and you're yeah. gonna fucked, right? It's like exactly. Yeah, it kind of forces you fit where. Oh, it was so good for it. me that you know I needed that. Right. So because yeah. sit you in a sit you in a dark room, close your close your eyes, and fold your legs, and say, "Hey, get in the flow state." It's like, come on, bro, fuck off. You yeah. know, like all I'm doing right now is thinking about everything else, right? Step right up, all you bearded men and all you bearded ladies. This quad brought to you by Big Top Beard Company, whose all-natural beard oil products not only make your beard smell amazing, but feel amazing, too. Their organic essential oil blends transport you to manly places like the mountains, the desert, the sea, and beyond, all while encouraging a lot of beard nuzzling to boot. Buy it for yourself or as a gift for that special bearded someone at BigTopBeardCompany.com. Enter the discount code Mind Pump for 33% off at checkout. Speaking of uh, this weekend, too, we had Brink in here. He sent over uh, an email over to us. Uh, had some, I know a, a lot of his clients listen to the show. W- what's up with the email? Yeah, he had some uh, clients between ages 45 and 60. They're in good shape. However, they become obsessed with their own mobility. And so that's where their focus has gone. And now they feel like they're having a hard time staying in the game as far as the workouts are concerned. And they're concerned that they're losing their aesthetics and strength. Mm. There's some uh, questions here. One from a 56-year-old female. She's been in treatment with him for one and a half months. And this is what she says. After a month of doing the mobility movements and not lifting, I'm starting to freak out a bit because I may be losing my muscularity. It's been an identity for me for a long time. 
And while the mobility is really satisfying way more than lifting for sure, it's going to take me a while to build enough mobility and a strong enough cord to build muscle with it. Any guidance about how to manage this identity change? I'm softening up and I don't like it. This is close to home for me. This is what I'm going through right now. So I can totally relate to this. Uh, being a guy who, uh, if you've listened to this podcast since the beginning, I've been, um, you know, I used to say, like, I'm all show, no go. Like, all I care about is I want to look good, you know. And, of course, I was in men's physique, so that was my main focus. And <clears throat> now I've made this transition into, you know, mobility. And I've dove head first, full on into it, completely embraced it. Uh, challenged myself to not care about. I don't. T- I'm not taking any mirror selfies. I'm not weighing myself. I'm not checking my body fat percentage. I've completely embraced the concept that I'm going to work from the inside out and work on all my imbalances and my neurological connections and poor patterning and get this get my body working optimally. And you know, I would be lying to say that that isn't a mental challenge for me. It's fucking hard, man. It's really hard, especially when you talk about a guy like me who had deep rooted insecurities with being smaller and, you know, got it. Uh, I was literally in the suite um, at this concert the weekend last weekend and uh, ran into Navarro Bowman and I hadn't seen him since uh, last year. And I was competing the, the last time I'd seen him. And the very first time I'd met him, I met him and he was with a couple other Niners and walked up and he was like, damn dude he walked over and he grabbed my shoulders my arm and it's like dude to have someone a guy of size and power and as as known as someone like navarro bowman like like looking at me and touching my muscles and being all in odds for that fucking ego just went <laughs> felt <laughs> felt amazing right I and then navarro bowman to touch me so i i ran into that him i ran into him the weekend and uh, said, what's up? And he comes walking up to me and he grabs me on my arms. And he goes, what happened, bro? And I thought, oh, dude, just a fucking knife right into the, right into the ego. And uh, I just kind of chuckled and, and kind of shared a little bit of my journey, what's been going on. We got caught up and stuff. But point being that, you know, that that's something that I have to work on all the time. And, you know, th- those feelings are those uncomfortable feelings that I have. I, I just have to remind myself that on the other side of that is growth. You know, so I, instead of like uh, being frustrated with it, I go like, you know what? Like, I'm so much better today about that and dealing with that than I was just two, three years ago and definitely five years before that and most certainly 10 years before that. So if I'm still feeling this way, to me, it's like, oh, I still have room for growth here. So instead of looking at it like, oh my God, it's like the thing with building muscle, I I easily, I know that I can focus on building muscle like especially the muscle that you've already put on your body already, that, that shit will come back so fast if that's something that I want. But this, what I'm, what I'm doing for my body as far as mobility, like that's going to carry on for so much longer and is so much more beneficial. And so, you know, if you feel like, you know, this is something that you have an, and then hundred percent. And I know in the rest of the question, she's, she even like, I think she even calls herself out. Right. And says that she knows that it's, you know, self-esteem and self-image and self-confidence, um, you know, I think the best thing, the best advice I can seeing that saying that I'm going through it with you is that, you know, look at that. Like if it, if it bothers you, if it's a challenge, that means there's opportunity for growth in that area. And instead of turning back or getting frustrated, embrace it more and go forward. Because I think the, the further you go with that, the, the, the more comfortable you'll become. And so for me, like part of that too, is like wearing clothes that I would, I would like disguise myself. So I don't look skinny or small or doing those things. And instead of that, I'm embracing that and, and being comfortable with who I am. And I know that sounds weird as a, as a man who's been in men's physique to talk like this, but it's fucking real, you know? And I think that a lot of people don't share that and don't say that. And I'll tell you right now, 90% of those men and women that get on stage that most people idolize and look at their physiques, most of them have the biggest insecurities out of the average person. So to say that they don't, they're full of shit, you know, like that's what normally drove those people to be so neurotic about getting in shape. So for me, you know, if I feel like I'm struggling with that, then that's a reflection for myself that there's a lot of room for growth still there. So, so, so I yeah. think when, when we look at this, some, okay. So a couple things with her, she's been doing this for one month. Okay. And she's a 58 year old female. Now 
56. 56. Your, your situation is more extreme. Um, and it, there's a couple questions I'd want to ask you because there is a dramatic difference, right? In the way you look from when you competed to now. But are all things equal? Is your nutrition as meticulous? Is your, in terms of calories and protein, are you on the same level of androgens? Are you as consistent with your workouts? Because I would argue, and I'll argue this all day long, that if you take most people who, who are natural, who work out consistently to build muscle, and if they make a, uh, if they make a targeted effort for mobility training, that they're not going to see a huge decrease in muscle. Yeah. They're well, just not. Yes and no. This is where I'm going to defend her on this. Is it's it's hard to live in both worlds, and you tend to. And you're right on everything you said about me. So 100. percent I mean, uh, my testosterone level is uh, probably 50 percent less than what it was when I was competing. Um, I'm not. I'm not counting calories. I'm for sure under consuming protein intake on quite a few days, you know, in the month. Uh, my, my training routine is way more inconsistent. So I definitely would have a, a closer to aesthetic physique had I kept all those things up. But part of me really embracing it actually was to let go of that stuff. So, and and maybe that's part of where she's going through that yeah. too. And and I so I looked at it like you went all in with it, yeah. Instead of trying to hybridize, fuck it and yeah, like keep both, fuck together. Yeah. yeah. Because then I feel like I would be, I I would be you know flirting with one and not really fully committing. Like I'm there's a reason why I committed is tattooed on my forearm. Like yeah. if I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to go all in. And if I'm going to truly say I'm going to well, do somewhat the, polar energy forces, they right? are, yeah, they well, are. And, and that's and, and and that's my point is that your yours is pretty extreme in the sense that you were a competitive uh, physique competitor she's this is one month in and she's talking about how she's afraid of losing muscularity i don't i i bet you if we saw her picture from the beginning to the end of 30 days we wouldn't notice that big of a difference i think more of this yeah, is it, in her i think much much of more course, of this all is in her mind all of yeah. it all of it's in the head that's what i'm trying to get at yeah. is all of it's in the head but it's okay it's okay that she feels this way and i can identify with you know, making a shift from being someone that was so heavily focused on building a muscular physique. And, and the way I, the reason why I can identify so much is because I guarantee I'm even more extreme, but that's, that's what I meant by, yeah. you know, go deeper. You know what I'm saying? Let it go, let it go. It's not, I'll tell you right now, you could, as hard as you've worked, I've worked for 15 plus years on building this muscular physique. And I completely have like let that side go to completely focus on mobility. And you're right, Sal's right. I could, I could be having more of a balance. I could be focusing. I could keep more of an aesthetic look while I'm doing this. If I, but that's just it. Part of this process for me is letting that go mm. and not caring about it and being okay with that. So I'm by me kind of letting go of all that is also me kind of challenging me mentally that I can be okay with it. Now, what you're going to see with me real soon here, so ironically that we're talking about this, is I'm about to shift gears again and really dial in all my training, my diet, tracking my steps again, and I'm going to start to build on this really mobile physique that I've been working on for the last year. So you're going to get to see both. But part of me really embracing this mobility side too was knowing that it was what I needed, not only physically, but also mentally. And part of that had to do with, I wanted to let go of that. And I, and I, and I am intentionally not caring about yeah, muscularity. I, I get that, but I'm wondering how much, if you took the typical you know, gym rat, someone who's consistent with their workouts, if you took them and changed their workout from focusing constantly on building mass and changed it to more mobility, uh, uh, full range of motion type movements. And their diet doesn't have to change. Uh, if they're eating healthy before, they could eat the same after. It's just the workout that changes. I I don't think you're going to see people, except for those that are on the extreme levels, I don't think you're going to see people go from this dramatic change in how they look. Yeah. I've done it many times. My body weight changes a few pounds, which is nothing. If I go strict you know, conditioning, mobility type stuff versus other. we've had people do maps performance who've come out and said, I, I'm surprised to have, I built more muscle. Mm. It's, it's, it's surprising. I think most of this is, is, uh, like misconstrued, uh, like, like, Oh shit. If I stop training like a bodybuilder, I'm gonna lose yeah, all this muscle. Out. Well, I knew too, that if I was going to really embrace the mobility side that I, I, I couldn't, I felt it. 
Like I would start training and I would get that itch, that drive for the for the the bodybuilder side of me to build muscle when I knew damn well that I need to be putting more work into my mobility. And I and you know when when we're when you're training and you're lifting heavy and you're trying, I mean, we created programs to live in both worlds. So let's be honest, it's possible. It's integrative. Yes, it's integrative. It's possible. You can do it. But where I'm going with this, and wh- wh- where I can just totally relate with how she feels right now, and if you want to break the psychological part, then try. The answer isn't find a way to do it to make sure you keep as much muscle and find mo- mobility. It's embracing it. Yeah, no, I'm not saying to find a way. I'm saying for most people, if you, you know, you're not cutting your testosterone in half, you're not going from eating 3,500 calories a day to eating, you know, 2,000 calories. You're not doing all these other cra- crazy drastic changes, which by the way, had you done those changes and kept your routine complete bodybuilding, you would have seen a dramatic change in your body. Well, I can speak to from strength element of it, right? So, um, you know, just living in, in the mobility side for, for quite some time, um, like a lot like Adam is talking about, like there's, there's a period where you really start to kind of get into that, that phase where like, this is benefiting my body. I'm doing all this for my joints and, um, and, and I'm trying to work on range of motion and I feel really good and, and charged and all this. Now I have to kind of, if I've been focusing on that for a long enough period of time, there's a lot of like friction there for me to now ramp back up and start working on my strength gains and start deadlifting really heavy again and, you know, squatting heavy. And, um, so it's, I mean, it's a challenge. Let's be honest. Like, so it, either way, like, you know, you know, it's benefiting you, but at the same time, like you, you already start, you need to start thinking ahead. You need to start adding and implementing these things. So now we can kind of bridge our way back uh, to that integrative approach where it's all included. And remember, and keep this in mind, like if you start making, yeah, it can take some time. Like I, I took my belt off and changed my grip on deadlifts for like eight months. I didn't deadlift over 450 pounds for eight months. And I, I was a regular yep. 500 plus pound puller all the time. And I had to drop the weight, go double overhand grip, you know, take my belt off. I didn't lose any muscle. Or if I did, it was a little bit. It wasn't much. It wasn't totally noticeable. I just went back to using my belt again. And I'm, I can already see I'm getting close to where I was lifting before. But now I feel more connected to the weight and I feel different. I think for most people, you focus on mobility if you lose aesthetics, it's going to be small. It, when you go back to training for aesthetics, after having fixed a lot of your mobility issues, you'll probably achieve better aesthetics, better balance, better movement because your range of motion and control will be much better. Yeah. In the long run, your aesthetics will uh, will benefit. Now, I'm not talking to the to the to the super small minority of people who go on a stage and compete uh, because that is such an extreme uh, expression of aesthetics that. In order to look like that, you have to be that extreme. You know what I'm saying? You have to do all the stuff that's extreme to do that. But most people, like this 56-year-old woman, you know, if she fixes her mobility issues, connection issues, and then over time, let's say over the course of six months or however long it takes, because it can take a while, it can take as long as a year, right? She goes back to some of her older exercises and focuses on building muscle. I bet you she's going to come out of it looking better with less effort than yeah. she did before. Oh, no, absolutely. You know? I, I think that's the the fear. She's generating I think that momentum. That's the, it. The fear we have, right, is, and, and I, I think why I'm a great example is because I am so extreme that, I mean, if I were to go take my body fat test right now, okay, I'm pretty good at this because I've done this so many times. I'm probably sitting at about 180 80 something pounds of actually lean body mass. And when I was at the peak of my competing, I was up to about 208 so that's a fucking lot of muscle. Yeah. That's a lot 20 of pounds. I, but I will tell you something right Over now. 20 pounds. You'd be surprised how fast I'll get that back. It's not as once you've been there, of course. It's really yeah. actually easy. It's a lot of work to get one more pound of muscle, one more pound yeah. of muscle, but it's amazing how resp- I, I I've been blown I'm blown away away by it every time I do this. Now, do you do you adjust uh testosterone levels with that along with that? Like, hey, I'm going to build muscle now, I'm going to take more. Oh, if I was competing, I would. This time okay. I won't. So this time keep it the same. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you I'm, keep it at replacement. I'm not going to try and get to my com- competitive i'm not because it'd be interesting to see how much because there's zero science around this like studies at least but anecdotally we see it right it'd be interesting to see 
how much that makes a difference. You know what I mean? Versus, okay, here's the androgen levels I was at before, and this is how much lean body mass, and now how much lean body oh, mass. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, it'd I, be interesting I, to see if you could match it. Uh, yeah. I think if I better think, training. I think if I was, you know, lifting as here's why I, here's a thing like, there's times where, like now where I know I need to lift for muscle reasons, like to build. Like I need, if I want to keep building size or maintain size, I go, I go into today's workout. But then in my head goes, what I really could use is like an hour of just movement, you know, May spells, Indian clubs, doing some of our maps anywhere and priming fortification mm-hmm. sessions. And I could spend a whole hour plus just doing that. And you guys don't see a lot of work that I do at home and outside sure. of here. Like to get where I'm at, like where my mobility is now, that has been a lot of dedication purely to that. And it's been it, like two years. Yeah. yeah and a, well, not that long, maybe, but it's been, it's been a solid year of maybe more really, really addressing it to where I, the, and it's been a process. The beginning was, I was a little resistant the beginning. And to be honest, when I watch you work on your mobility right now, it reminds me of where I was at when I first started really trying. Then I got to a point where like, dude, I want to be able to I want to be able to sit and ass to grass, bro, with 300 pounds on my back and feel comfortable. I want to be able to do a pistol squat. I want to be able to take myself with an overhead, you know, uh, barbell overhead press and not feel like I have forward head. I can't even get put my back flat against a wall with a wall press. Like I have all these things that I've been like measuring and uh, going after. And that has become so, I've been so focused on that that all the other shit is not a priority. And, you know, someone who's 56 may have as many imbalances as I do, and that could require a lot of that work. And you can, you, I mean, it's your body. That's the beautiful thing. Like, if you feel that you need to go the other direction, that's fine. But what I, what I will tell you is even let's pretend like you decided to do what I did, which is just say, fuck it. I'm not going to worry about the muscle thing. It's actually really easy to get it back. It is not that what is a lot of work and a lot of dedication is to put the time and effort you need to put in to repattern bad patterns that you've created for 40, 50 years. And that may require her to let go of the weight training so much and become heavily focused just on the movement and the patterning. Then when you get good at that, then going and kind of switching, but don't be afraid. Don't be afraid that you're going to lose a ton of muscle. I promise you, you'd be so blown away by how much you'll get that back. Quick interruption by our sponsors, you guys. Lots of people have been asking us how they can support the Mind Pump Mafia family. Our first one is our Chimera Coffee that we love. You guys go to ChimeraCoffee.com. That's Chimera with a K for 10% off. Don't forget Mind Pump at the checkout. We also have our Big Top Beard Company.com for 33% off. Also, Mind Pump at the checkout. Checkout. Also, Brain FM. We talk so much about this for sleep and meditation. It's Brain.fm for 20% off. Also, Mind Pump at the checkout. You guys, we also talk a lot about books on here all the time. We're using that Audible. You guys can get a free trial, 30-day trial, plus one free audio book if you go to audibletrial.com forward slash mind pump. And then last, we get lots of people asking about Ben Greenfield's CBD supplement, so we hit him up to hook you guys up. You go to getnaturedblend.com forward slash mind pump for that discount. Next question is from Dr. Kuv. What is your most recent nightmare? Oof. What do you oh feel fear as an adult? So we're talking about literal nightmare. Like I went to sleep and had a bad dream. Could I think be. that's what they to- Sure. Well, I don't think you have to say a literal. What's what stresses you out? Right yeah. Now, well, know? I mean, because let's say as an adult, that's probably the. Cl- I don't even have nightmares anymore. If no, I have a nightmare, well, I can control it. Yeah. I'll start because I know Sal's going to say something about kids. Because I'm going to say something about kids first. Oh, <laughs> dude. <laughs> After a couple scares and going to the ER, you've had a couple recent ones. Yeah, like. That's what keeps me up at night sometimes. Sometimes just like you just hear noises or whatever and then like this instant panic and then I just jump out of bed and and then run out and I just make sure like that noise wasn't coming from downstairs or my my boys are downstairs so um yeah but like that's 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 the thing now cuz uh cuz of those two <laughs> two things it's it's like this crazy insane just just panic and <laughs> you know like fear and and it's real dude you know? have you ever I never lo- had that before. have you ever lost your kids for like a second oh lost them like yeah um yeah fucking worst feeling yeah, well, yeah once yeah. fuck it I, I, rem- I remember one when my son god he must have been let's see five i mean he was real young and we had just bought a house and we were remodeling it so we were living with my in-laws for a month while remodeling the other house mm-hmm 
And we put my son to bed and he, we were all sharing a room upstairs in my in-law's house. And so he was in sleep and he was young again. I think he was five and it was hot summertime. So we had the window open and we go downstairs and we're all watching a movie or whatever. And uh, at the time my wife goes upstairs like to, like she's going to go to bed. And all of a sudden she goes, she comes down the stairs. She goes, where, you know, where's Domenico? And we're like, what? And this, and I knew the window was open to the bedroom and this fucking panic came over me like I've never experienced oh my in my God. entire life. Because he's in the house, the window's open, he's a small child, where would he be, right? Yeah. I like, I could not, I mean, I flew up the stairs, I think I took two steps and, yeah. and cleared the entire stairs. <laughs> and you what had happened- Superhuman, like, reactions, yeah. Like, like crazy. And what had happened was, is he had, he had walked into the closet and fallen asleep. And we, we <laughs> couldn't find him for a grand total- <laughs> Of one oh, minute, no. it was literally sixty seconds, but it was the most felt ter- like a lifetime just terror, the most terrifying oh. sixty seconds of my life. Brutal. And you know what's funny? I don't know, Justin, if you go, if you kind of realize this yourself, but I realized after having kids, like I wasn't there was nothing to be scared of before I had kids. Like I look back, I'm like, what the yeah. fuck was I worried about? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, it's trivial, you know. Like that's that's how I feel about it now. But like you know, but it was real then. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, like just. Just the face, like, so, yeah, my son was choking, and uh, he had swallowed a marble, and it was, like, a big marble, and it was lodged, and so, like, you know, my wife was the first to find him, and then brought him upstairs, and I was, like, you know, dead asleep, and then she's like, ah, and then I was like, ah, (laughs) and then she's the nurse, and so she's calling, and I figure, like, hey, you know, like, like, she was, like, losing it, and I was, like, trying, okay, I have to be the one to, like, keep everybody together here. And so, like, you know, it was, okay, here's what we're going to do, you know. And meanwhile, like, my son's turned white, you know, and, like, and, and so we, we put him, we opened up the, the freezer door, and we have him in there just to to calm his his uh, throat so he could breathe in oh, cold wow. air. And then that was able to loosen up a bit, and it, it was able to kind of pass. But, uh, and then the the um, the ambulance came and everything, and, uh, and then it finally just went all the way. And so... We were good, but like it was like lodged there for like, and you but couldn't it get it. You couldn't do Heimlich. You couldn't do any. It of that wasn't stuff. in his windpipe though. No. Okay. So yeah, we just we 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 dodged a bullet with that, and then he just passed it out. You know. Through, oh, scary. Yeah, food. I mean, for I mean, that was the scariest things ever happened to me. It gives me anxiety. Besides, it, it does, dude. Besides kids, because that's an obvious one. Uh, you know what would be one of my biggest nightmares would be to be. In a situation where you feel like, uh, for me at least, where I'm worthless, you know what I mean? Like, okay, I need to, I want to start a business or I want to go become employed or do something like that, and I don't have anything to offer anybody, mm-hmm. and I feel like I don't have any value. I think that would be that 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 was a, a nightmare for me for a little while. And I think it was mainly because I did not go the formal education route. I went, you know, I worked for a large company, I managed gyms, and then I owned my own business and. You know, there was a little bit of that insecurity of not having a degree, not having, you know, the that that you know that those letters or whatever that you know that diploma, and having uh, a little bit of the fear, like, whoa, you know, like, am I am I going to have value if I need to go work for someone or if I got to start something else? And I think that was more based on, uh, I guess, an insecurity at the time. But you know, now as an adult, uh, besides that, I don't know if I can think of too much else i guess uh it, it's all revolved around my kids like if i think of anything that really scares me like natural disaster it's around like oh my god what's gonna happen to my kids or you know illness like yeah. if i get sick well spiders yeah uh, yeah besides spiders yeah. i guess that would be it. yeah i don't know if i um i definitely don't have a recent nightmare i can't even tell you the last time i even had a nightmare um and a fear as an adult <sighs> fuck me dude uh i don't and I think this is where I'm like Sal, maybe like if there is like, the only thing I could relate to this is if, okay, if I, if what, what stresses me out or what could like cause like a major state change for me where I'm just like super irritable or I flash on somebody or I'm just, I'm out of character to where it's just keeping me up at night. I can't sleep. Um, I'm really good though. Now I think of, of being aware of when that, when I feel that coming on or if I get like that and, and putting into practice some of the things that I do to, to bring that down and to relax. And for me, it's kind of similar to what Sal said, like mine is getting stuck in it, in this, like in this place, like where, um, where I don't have growth, right. Where I'm not, where the business isn't growing where I'm not growing where I'm just kind of like, you know, that clock puncher, like even though I'm the furthest thing from that, but 
that's part of what makes me not that guy is that's a big fear of mine. Like, and, and I know in the back of my head, I've always, I've always like when I dive into something, right. And we're going to build a new business or do something. I go like, well, I always know that if shit doesn't work out, you know, I could always go this, I could do this job. You know, I could go work for somebody from nine to five. I can make, you know, six figure income and, and I could live and I could be fine. But that's my greatest fear. Like, that's not what I ever want to do. And I think that's what motivates me. And there's this, you know, fear inside that that could happen. And so that's a lot of what drives me. Now, when I realize that it's bleeding into my relationships with others is when I address it, right? So, you know, really easily, like in this current business that we're in right now, we go, we've, and I've already experienced this multiple times where we go through these uh, growth spurts or where we get to hit these lulls and the, the business seems stagnant. And in business, you're either growing or dying. It's not, you know, anyone who ever says that it's stagnant or staying the same is full of shit. So, you know, the moment that it's stagnant, that's the moment it's dying to me. So when I, when we go through those moments, uh, in the business, I get, it stresses me out. It'll keep me up at night. And, you know, that will drive me crazy. Like, I don't have nightmares. I don't, I don't do that. If I had a nightmare, I I've at one point in my life, I've figured out how to control them. So I normally end up stabbing the guy and killing him and <laughs> I come out to be like the superhero, right. Or bring the chick home. Like, you know, so yeah. night fears, nightmares actually go my way. So it's whenever they, they start off bad, but they end up really heroic. So, so you do, you do lucid dreaming. Yeah, well, I don't know what you call it. Yeah, lucid is when you know you're dreaming, so you can start to control what's going on. I only, you know, it's funny you say that. It only seems lucid though if it becomes a nightmare. If it becomes a nightmare, like I have this ability. Oh, to Oh, then like, you control it. Yeah. So if it's not a nightmare, you're not aware. That yeah, it's if it's not a nightmare, I'm normally deep asleep. But if it's scary or a, you know something that someone's chasing me or you get some of like that, like right away, I'm like, this ain't real. Dude, I used to get those dreams like when I was a kid, and then later when you know when you wake up. Or you, you think you're awake, but you're not awake yet. And it feels like somebody's like sitting or like stepping on your chest. And like, I couldn't like really breathe. Yeah, that's, that's a common one. That's, I've yeah. never had that that's before. That's Satan. It was totally it's Satan, bro. Yeah, it's a devil. It's a de- it's a demon. I know. It's so a I was demon. Like, I was it's like, a demon. I was like, you even more. be gone, demon. And then I was fine because yeah. I have Jesus. You yeah. know, they say dreaming dreams are uh, fucking strange. It's such a mystery. Like, there's so many different theories. The one that I uh, that I tend to, uh, you know, believe in, or, or at least the one that resonates most with me, is that you have particular feelings and emotions, um, and you go to sleep with these emotions, mm. and your brain tries to make sense of the emotions by creating uh you know creating a consciousness around it around it and since you're not awake it invents it so if you're you know if you've got all these problems that are mounting and you're stressed out about it and then you go to sleep it could maybe be like this big monster that you can't get away from and that's chasing you or maybe you're super insecure about your appearance and so then you have a dream that your teeth are falling out uh, or you're really afraid of doing a presentation, so you, maybe you dream that you're naked, you're or that, naked. You, or that, that you forgot to study for a test. You know, like it's like your feelings. There's like a whole getting book manifested. On we have it. Oh, you do. Mm-hmm. On yeah, interpreting yeah. your dreams. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, it's pretty. It's uh, it's pretty interesting. I um, mean, I definitely think that's uh, to me that's. It sounds know. common sense. Like, yeah, that's know, how I feel. Stuff, I mean, yeah. it's, it it's, it's like on your it. it's on your mind. Your your brain trying to put yeah. something together. Or it's the last movie you watched, you know, a couple of days ago. Yeah, it's because that's in your mind, right? Yeah. That's the last thing you yeah, just you just consumed or whatever. Visuals. I guess the, the, another you know one direction this kind of makes me want to ask you guys is you know we have fears, right? As an adult, is it? There, I guess there's, there's got to be a balance between letting a fear drive you and letting it be the only thing that drives you, right? Because yeah. a fear, uh, being fear driven, tends to make us behave in ways. You could use fear, you know, in well, order to um, kind of like you know, propel you forward. The, they say on the other side of fear is success. So I think there's nothing wrong with being afraid and having that. Like that's kind of like goes. Got to recognize this it. goes back to the question that we were just talking about. Like, so a fear of mine, okay, is to be skinny like I was in high school again and lose all my muscle and like, you know, feel inadequate or what not feel buff and muscular. But that's part of like what I meant by I'm full all the way in. Like no way. Like I feel like I would be like putting my foot in just a little bit if I was really still kind of focused on making sure I keep as much muscle as I want. Like, no, fuck that. I'm going to embrace this. I'm going to embrace this look, this hippie look, dude. I'm going to go all in. I'm going to become mobile. I'm going to fix all these issues. I'm not going to be insecure about this stuff. I'm going to fully commit that way. I'm going to face that fear all the way. So to me, that's kind of... So it's not driving you though. At that point, your fear is... Because when your fear was driving you, it would drive you to not 
mm-hmm. go mo- not go into mobility, right. not going into that stuff. So I think the important thing is just identifying the fear, but not be driven by it in the sense where you're so scared of something that it, it you, you controlling know. it versus it controlling you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. That's mm-hmm. why, yeah, I've always had a fear of like, you know, saying the wrong thing. And so now I just always say the wrong thing just to get out there <laughs> first, you know, like, oh, fuck shit, you know, ah. yeah. hey guys, you yeah. know. Well, that's, I mean, that, that, I mean, you, you expressed that when we first started that there was, you know, uh, fear for you getting on the mic. It's not something you want to do. You faced that. Absolutely. That's I mean, absolutely I, a fear of mine. You know, like I, I just, I like to be a fly on the wall sometimes and, and, um, you know, even in conversation with close friends, like I'll, we'll get into it if it's a topic and, but I don't feel the need to be heard as much. Like, I don't feel like I need that. I don't need feedback from people to tell me what I am or what I'm not doing. I don't need that. I can do things myself very well and I can assess myself and what I'm capable of and, but my communicating that to somebody else as far as that's what I need to work on. You know, mm-hmm. I need to be able to express my ideas better. And, you know, so I built a nice comfort system. I feel I feel like a lot of I think definitely most of us in this room, I for sure, speaking for myself, can uh, can say that I'm a fear seeker. Like, yeah, I look for it. Like if something rattles me or something, uh, I don't want to do it. Like instantly. I want to headbutt it. Yeah. Yeah. Instantly. And I've said this on a a previous podcast that that's a state change, right? If I'm cruising around my day, you know, one of you guys says, Hey, let's go do this. And I'm like, all all of a sudden either fear or doubt or insecurity comes in my mind. And like, I go, Whoa, Whoa, where did that come from? Like, looks like I have something to address. Like, because on the other side of that is success and is growth. So it, when you when you shift your mentality to instead of trying to avoid fear and stay away from it, is looking for it in your life and conquering it. Um, I mean, it's just gr- growth, 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 growth all the time. Um, I don't know. It's it's t- it's tough for me to find it. And I tell you what, like I'll let you know when I come across another thing that that's that, and I'll address it. I probably the closest thing to that now is the uh, you know losing all my muscle, which I'm no longer afraid of. Next question is from Mr. Yeah. Ball Challenge. Oh. <laughs> what kind of ball challenge are we talking about here? <laughs> well, he's currently training to be a spin instructor. He's two weeks in, his knees are hurting, and he's told that he rides well. So he's wondering if you think it's going to continue. And he also wants your opinion on the pros and cons of spinning. So if you're doing if you're doing something... So first off, spinning is, uh, obviously, for those of you who don't know, um, it's a... It's like you're riding a stationary bike in a class. Oh, it's very I thought intense. it was like, you know, you're in a Spinning field a and you're just, yeah. yay! <laughs> tread, tread lightly here. Yeah. Like it could be one of those. <laughs> yeah. tread, uh, tread lightly when we talk about spinning, yoga, or runners. Yeah. Oh my God, that's well, my religion. <laughs> well, so here's the thing. So spin, typically very intense classes. They're, they're you know, cycle-based uh, because you're on a bike. And you're following uh, an instructor who's telling you to go more intense, less intense, simulate riding hills and you know, sitting on your seat and stuff like that. It's like any form of repetitive motion. It can, it will, if you, if it's all you do, it will create imbalances. So if all I do is spin, I'm going to create some, uh, promote some muscles to be stronger Mm. and some muscles to be tighter. I'm going to lengthen some muscles and, and strengthen others in positions that are good for cycling, which means I may create imbalances for walking, for lifting things up, for other types of activities. So that's, That's the problem with spinning. The problem with spinning is the same problem that we have with any repetitive motion. Is if that's all you do, it will eventually right. cause you problems. Now, in this particular case, if he's trained to be a spin instructor and he's already fit, I think I know who this person is, and his knees are bothering him, it may be due to an imbalance, but it also may be due to just overuse. Because at the end of the day, you can, you can hurt because you overuse something because your body's not used to it. Like... You know, if if you're if you've never spin this much in your life, and all of a sudden you're spinning like crazy, even with good form and stuff, you can still get inflammatory issues in the joints that are used the most. And in this case, it's your knees. So this may be a case of you might need to spin less. You may need to focus uh, a little bit more time on rest and recovery, and maybe some you know uh, foam rolling and stretching and mobility work, mm. uh, because if you push past this point may not be a good thing. You may cause yourself some issues uh, in your knees. And it depends on where your knees hurt. But uh, I, you know, I've known people to get things like chondromalacia, which is, 
you know, uh, inflammation and, and, you know, issues with the bottom of uh, underneath the, the patella, which once you get to that point, uh, kind of sucks. It's hard to, yeah. to come out of it if you can come out of it. So I think, um, for sure address the, or look into the YouTube series that I just did with, uh, uh Dr. Jordan shallow. Uh, we did a whole series on hip health and, in in my experience, especially with somebody who has a good a good physique, like I know he I know he's in good shape aesthetically, right? Uh, someone so he's lifting weights, he's training. When I have somebody who their knees are bothering them from doing something like all of a sudden cycling, uh, a lot of the times it could be related to uh, hips, hip health, and it could be uh, overactive muscles and underactive muscles that are going on. And a lot of times uh, related to the IT and TFL and. Your IT runs all the way down and inserts in the front of the patella. And uh, if that's uh, super, super tight, that can cause stress on there. And then all you're doing is, and then when you're pedaling, that's all, you know, quad hip flexor dominant to do that. So a lot of anterior uh, muscles that are going on there. So you could be super overactive and tight. So opening up the hips and making sure you have good uh, mobility before you get in. So priming your body Mm -hmm. uh, before you get into your cycling class. Um, I would look into that pros and cons. I mean, right with Sal, the, the pros of it and great cardio. Uh, You get to do like Hills and you can do sprints and you get some of your hit type of cardio in there. So great for burning fat, great for burning calories uh, and could be interactive and fun because you have friends and a lot of hot girls take spin classes, so that's also a pro. Yeah. Um, cons. Um, I think the the biggest con I'd say is um, a lot of people get really addicted to this. Um, they get addicted to how fun it is, the hot girls in class and all the calories they burn, and then it became it becomes something that they do three, four, five times a week. And there's not enough of the other stuff to keep them very balanced. And it's, and, or it becomes, uh, something that is the only way that they can get in shape is Mm -hmm. when I take, when I take spin, I'm in the best shape of my life, you know? And well, to go along those, you know, along that pathway, I could, I can relate on the sense that like I went through a period of just playing basketball as my get in shape. And that was my workout, you know? And um, just, just stepping outside the gym and getting really into the conditioning element of basketball and, uh, just the explosive movement. And, um, I mean, there's a lot going on, but at the same time, like it was, it was wear and tear on my joints. It was wear and tear on my ankles, my knees, like, uh, my, my lower back. And, uh, you know, it, as, as fun as it was, I had to understand that like, I need to build my body up. I need to build up the strength and support my joints. And I need to, I need to work, uh, back in the gym and, um, but it's still fun. You know, it's a great experience. It's something that's like, if that, if spin provides that for you and it's, it's an activity for you, keep it in your life. You know, like, that's the thing. Like we don't have to all like the same shit. Right. But uh, at the same time, like you got to benefit your body for the long haul and your joints and think about uh, if, it, if, you, if your posture is starting to decline, if, if you're having aches and pains constantly, uh, you really got to be reflective on that and, and f- figure out like what what that's really doing for you. Yeah. And don't forget the the, sp- the spin is not what's hurting your knees. OK, so it's not the spin class, especially if someone's telling you you have great form. Something that's just your body letting you know that there's something wrong. Right. So that's where you go back and you start looking into, you know, the hips and area. And typically it's, you know, and especially if it's, it's going from a spin and you're in that seated position, my guess would be hips. You know, you're going to go, you're going to go either to hips or to the ankle is more than likely causing issues with the knee in a spin. Uh, I would think it's less likely the ankles and more likely uh, related to the hips. So I would go in that area. Well, and there's also the – when people are riding spin bikes uh, or bikes in general, I used to train a, a, a high-level uh, cyclist. He actually competed, and he would tell me how important the kick, like the pullback is in, in cycling. So it's not just the pushing down of the pedal, mm-hmm. which is all an, a lot of anterior, a lot of quad. It's also the pullback and then the extension with the ankle. And it doesn't contribute the majority of the power in cycling, but it does enough – to where it'll it'll make a substantial yeah I mean it, it could it definitely could be ankle I mean I would go there too although it's less likely for spending it's yeah. less likely it's more likely hips 
So I would look into that direction if if that's what's going now, on. Now, my, my experience with cyclists is the knee pain, and it, again, it depends where the knee hurts, but my experience training cyclists, a lot of the knee pain that people will complain about is where the patella uh, tendon meets the uh, tibia. So right at the tibial, what is that, tuberosity? And people will feel it like right down here where they'll get sore in their knees. And uh, one thing that uh, may help, and this is not a cure, uh, it's just will alleviate some of your symptoms, is after you're done with uh, your spin class, is to sit in a deep uh, quad static stretch, which should take some pressure off that patella tendon because it'll loosen up the quads. Your quads are already super warm and pumped from your spin class. So you just get into a deep quad stretch and really hold them for a while and then come out and see if that helps. I've had some success with some some of my cyclist clients with with doing that and where you know it was hard for them to to change anything because they were in the middle of training for uh, you know an event. Our best 99. Are the MAPS programs applicable for someone who is morbidly obese or in very poor shape? So I think we should first define what morbidly obese means because that's yeah, that's, a that's all that's another level of the community. Yeah, that's another level, right? Uh, obese. There's obese and there's morbidly obese, and it's defined in medical uh, terms as someone who is between forty to over fifty uh, in terms of the BMI. BMI. Uh. So it's it's a pr- it's a pretty heavy which we're person. talking about mostly like. Three, four, five hundred pound people. Uh, it depends on your height, right? Yeah, of course, uh, but I mean, you're, but it, it's it, you're you're pretty big, and it's only it makes up six point six percent of the population, um, which is doesn't that, sound that's huge. Really high, though, if you think about it's it. It's fifteen yeah. million Americans. Man, it's fifteen million Americans, and God, that that's a lot. the that's number a lot of rascal scooters. The number yeah. of morbidly obese Ameri- Americans over the last ten years has <laughs> jumped. Right now. Although you mean those are the motored ones, yeah, 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 uh, yeah uh, right. or the Lark. <laughs> Uh, I get around. That's that, uh, that number has gone up something like fifty or seventy percent. Like the, the the percentage of morbidly obese has grown tremendously over the last ten years, God, which is so crazy. Yeah. which is really crazy. More information, more knowledge, more tools, yeah. and yet we're still going that direction. It's we it's, are losing the fight, boys. It's pretty scary. Um, and you know, here here's the thing: when you're talking about morbidly obese or very very poor shape, you're talking about very deconditioned individual. Um, somebody who, if I've had clients like this, right, they've come and see me and, 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 and their workout consists of, Oh my God, Doug, thanks, Doug for that, that picture. Yeah. Appreciate that. Uh, it, Holy hottie for that. Um, you know, those individuals will come in and their training will consist of standing up off the bench, sitting down on the bench. Oh my God. What is uh, that? <laughs> uh, you know, it'll consist of lifting their arm above their head. Um, you know, trying to get good posture. It'll consist of Wait, what, very basic movements. What word did you just Google, Doug? I want people to be able to see this. Morbidly obese. That's okay, right. just, just quite just, a bit. Yeah. So, but you know what? So, so let's 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 be honest. Oh wow, there's even uh, where all the worst places are in America. Oh, the click, South. Click wow. on that. The South winds. Texas yeah. is that high? Wow. I think Mississippi was the fattest state. It's there's like the there's world a percentage champ. thing next My to God. it. My yeah. God. So let let's address. We can all agree, like if someone is morbidly obese, like MAPS is not the program for them. Walking, moving, like actually just moving the body is the program for them. Yeah. Uh, somebody who's in poor shape, though, who's on their way maybe to become morbidly obese and actually can, they, they don't have to ride in a scooter to get somewhere. They they actually can't because most people that are morbidly obese aren't even leaving their house, right? No, they can barely get out of their chair. Yeah, I mean, so, like getting up and down from a from a seated position is very, very difficult. Yeah, most somebody at a morbidly obese is actually into a is, car. is looking to do things like you know gastric bypass just so they could live and survive and knock off 100, 200 pounds just so they could eventually get up and move. So we'll address poor someone who's in really poor shape and maybe heading that direction. And yeah, absolutely, maps is. But we would regress that. Like, so, I mean, and, and Maps Anywhere was when we first were creating, I remember we were talking about this, like, you know, hey, we're going to create this at home program. So let's create something that, you know, people will be able to do this. Um, one, they could do like the Sean T fucking super intense. Uh, and then they can also be for somebody who is really lacks conditioning mobility and can work out. And so that was why we kind of flipped that program on its head. And it's designed that it's only two days of body weight movements. And then the other three days 
are in intensity sessions, right? So where you have the ability to intensify it. So that way it'll allow somebody who's in great shape, they can use that to progress the program and really push through it. And then if there was someone who's nowhere near the ready for that, then they would stick to just working on the body weight type movements, which mm -hmm. would be just sitting. that are reinforcing postural positions. Right. And yeah. It's going to, it's going to have that sort of a carryover from it. So yeah, we, we wanted to make sure we at least had an answer out there for somebody that's super deconditioned. So it's not like we're just throwing them into hitting the weights when they haven't even addressed all these imbalances or even just uh, lifting anything at all. So, so correct me if you, I mean, if you guys think otherwise, I mean, I think I would, if someone came to me and they're on their way to going this way and they said, Hey, what map should I do? I would stick them with maps anywhere, maps prime mm -hmm. and maps red. And I would, I would give them this. I would say, listen, maps prime. We're going to, we're going to incorporate that with maps anywhere. And then when you're ready to progress, we'll move you to MAPS Red pre-phase. Pre yeah, I would even say just do the fortification workouts in Prime for a little while because yeah. they're all based on correction. Right. And just do that right. before even doing uh, you know, MAPS Anywhere, um, uh, you know, body weight movements. Because some body weight movements, although they can be very uh, simple and basic, for some people who are really, really, really deconditioned, like a like the most basic movement. Well, I think that's a perfect well, example. Yeah. There, right? how, yeah. how you would decide that would be yeah. based off of that, right? Now, because you want to support the joints. I mean, because yeah. they're taking a lot of load, you know, and stress, and and so that that's why it's important to understand um, where you can optimize that. Meanwhile, like simultaneously get out and just do some real light activity as far as movement is concerned. So, so I, walk. I just looked up. Uh, what it would take for me to be classified. And by the way, they call this, they call morbidly obese, obese class three. And you guys want to guess why they changed the name from morbidly obese to obese class three? Yeah. I don't know the answer, but I'm going to take a wild yeah, guess. Class three. And say that they're trying not to offend people. Yeah, yeah. Right? So that you could say, hey, Dude, you're in class three me, man. obese instead of saying morbidly obese because people get yeah, offended. Yeah. Anyway, for me, who I'm, I'm six feet tall, I would have to weigh... 300 pounds to be uh, over 40 BMI. Now that's definitely big, but that's not so big that I'm uh, stuck in a, in, like you said, a rascal. Or yeah, a yeah, yeah. So I think there's a lot more people in this class, in this category of who are just, just, they don't, they're, they're not so deconditioned that they can't move, but they're definitely, you know, pretty big. Yeah. Um, and uh, the funny thing about BMI, which is a little side topic I know athletes who are uh, whose BMIs would put them in this morbidly obese. Like, oh, I'm, pr yeah. I'm pretty sure there's some NFL players. Are you kidding me? Who yeah. have a BMI over 40? Did who That's have why I don't, yeah. no problem moving? You know, BMI is garbage when yeah. it comes to that. When it, yeah, you, you could get somebody that's super muscular, and it's like, no, dude, come on, that doesn't work for that. Yeah. But uh, yeah, they need to have some sort of standard. So I understand that as well. Yeah, I, I'd say you know. Maps Prime fortification sessions. That's where I would start almost anybody who's deconditioned. I would have them do a compass test. Uh, if you're the if you're deconditioned, you're probably going to fail all three tests, and then it'll point you to fortification sessions uh, that are uh, connected to the three t the three tests that you failed. Now, for those of you who don't have Maps Prime and have no idea what I'm talking about, fortification sessions are correctional based workouts. They're they're exercises put together and programmed to correct, uh, you know, major, you know, muscle recruitment patterns and imbalances. And the focus of the workouts is not just different because of the exercises. It's also different because of the intent. For example, uh, a cable row, a seated cable row, or even a machine row might be present in a routine for building maximum muscle or bodybuilding or even for strength. So it may be the same exercise, but the intent's totally different. Like if I'm having someone who I'm trying to put in correctional uh, type workout and I'm having them do a, a machine row, a cable row, I'm having them use very lightweight, even for them, lightweight, not just lightweight relative, but even for them, something that's really light that they could do pretty easily. They could pull the weight back pretty easily, but the intent is perfect, perfect, perfect form like bringing the shoulder blades back and depressing them and pausing at the you know the, the the top of the rep where you're squeezing and coming forward with nice control making shoulder making sure the shoulders don't rise making sure that the that the wrists don't curl that I'm not getting this you know that everything stays straight and tense that I have good core stability the intention with correctional exercise 
is uh, as important, if not more important, than the exercises themselves. Because if I if I take that same exercise and put more weight on it, it's it's no longer correctional because that person's recruitment patterns will revert back to the old one. So if you're listening, you don't have a maps program and you're super deconditioned. That's the way you should approach your workouts. You should approach your workouts with perfecting your form and practicing your form and maybe take videos of yourself doing them and seeing if you can identify discrepancies between right and left and you can see that you know your shoulders may not be moving the way you want or your hips may not be moving the way you want. Uh, if you're on our forum, you can post those videos on the forum and have people assess them and then just perfect that and then over time slowly you know, add resistance to, uh, to what you're doing. So I guess that's it. There you go. Check it out. If you want to ask us a question that we can answer on our show, the best place to do it is on Instagram. Mind Pump Media is the page to do it. I have a personal page. It's Mind Pump Sal. Adam has one at Mind Pump Adam. Justin has Mind Pump Justin. And also at mindpumpmedia.com, we are still offering 30 days of coaching for free. All you got to do is opt in and you get it. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.